Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing today, and it will be posted to our archives page um, later for you to watch at your convenience. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our show recordings. Uh, both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, uh, anyone you think might be interested in any of the shows we have on Encompass Live. Uh, for those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries, so uh, possibly similar to your state library. So we provide training and resources and, and grants and programming to all types of libraries in the state. So you will find shows on Encompass Live uh, for all types of libraries. Public, academic, K-12, corrections, museums, archives, anything and everything. Really, our only criteria is that something to do with libraries, something cool libraries are doing, something we think they could be doing, book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, uh, demos of services and products, all sorts of things. Uh, we have guest presenters that come on Encompass Live sometimes, but uh, sometimes we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that talk about programs or services and things we're doing here through the commission. And uh, that's what we're doing today. Um, we have two library staff, commission library staff here with us today. Um, and that is because it is the last Wednesday of the month, which means it is Pretty Sweet Tech Day. Yay! <laughs> the last Wednesday of every month, Amanda Sweet. Morning, Amanda. Good morning. Is uh, our uh, technology innovation librarian. She comes on Encompass Live to do a presentation about something techy related. Um, we have shows at other times during the month that might be about tech things, but always the last Wednesday of the month, it will be Amanda um, sharing something like that. Um, so if you're the tech person at your library, this is the time to come, or you're interested in that kind of thing, this is the show to, to be here for. Um, but today's show and next month's show, we have a guest presenter, uh, Sherm, Andrew Sherman. Good morning, Sherm. And he is... Uh, new here at the commission. How long have you been here? A couple of months? Started in oh. January. January. Oh, longer than that. I'm sorry. Like I said earlier, time is just not, it doesn't <laughs> go the way it used to anymore. He's been here for six months now and he is new on our computer team, computer services team. And he is going to today talk to us about securing our public computers. Um, so protecting both you, your customers, your staff, everyone from anything bad that could happen um, and they'll be back with us for next month's free sweet tech on july 26th uh for another topic and we'll talk about that later so um i'll hand it over to you um amanda sure i don't know how all oh, i think amanda you said you're mainly just kind of um, here moral support decorative <laughs> yeah long for the ride yeah, yeah. Uh, so, Sherm, go ahead and tell us about how we can make things safe on our computers. All right. And you can all see my slideshow? Yes. yes. Yep. See the slides right. full screen? Looks perfect. So, um, public computers are pretty much a unique feature of libraries. Uh, there's really nobody else that offers that service to the community where you can just walk in, sit down, and have a computer uh, ready to go and use. Um, because it's such a unique service to libraries, um, there's a lot of steps that need to be taken to make sure that you're protecting the computer um, from misuse and abuse. And also, um, there's measures need to be taken so you're protecting your customers who come in and use it. So, you know, they're not leaving important documents on, uh, they're not leaving a, a history of trail, what they've done for the next person to sit down and use it. So there's there's quite a few steps that really need to be put in place um, to make all that happen. And then there's a few things we can do to make the computer a little more friendlier and usable um, for our customers that come and sit down. Uh, they're generally going to be there to do pretty much the same types of things. So there's a few shortcuts and things that we can have set up ahead, from ahead of time that'll make things a little easier to go for them. So our presentation today is kind of broken down into the four areas. We have the hardware, 
uh, the software, talk a little bit about the users, and we'll talk about the maintenance. The maintenance gets real important depending on if you have the other steps in place. That has a big impact on how uh, things have to be done to load updates and things like that. So and I'll mention here too, well, um, well, we have this first slide that has lots of different, you know, things here about what we're going to talk about. Um, the slides will be available afterwards along with the recording. So don't worry about trying to scribble down everything that's on the screen when you see it. Just sit back and listen, maybe take some notes if you want to. But you'll have all these full slides available to you um, later. Everyone who attended will be able to have those. Yeah, and the way I kind of built the presentation is to literally, once we have the presentation up, this would be a great punch list. Um, if you need to go back through your computers and get them set up uh, to ensure that they're set up properly, or if you have an IT support or somebody that's assisting you, it's something you can say, hey, we got this from the commission. This is what they say we should be doing on our public computers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, are we filling all the steps? And then I have hyperlinks throughout the entire presentation. So I'm not going to go into great depth on how you do the different tasks. The hyperlink is there. If you download the presentation, the hyperlink will take you right to instructions on how to do that particular um, task on the computer. So the first thing a lot of this I see get missed all the time as I visit libraries is if you're not familiar, so the BIOS is the, the chip that's on the motherboard that stores kind of the basic hardware operations of the computer and what you might notice when you first boot a computer up you'll see maybe the vendor's logo come up on screen and then you'll see something at the bottom of the screen that's like press escape press f10 press f12 something like that to bring the bios up and that lets you come bring up the bios that then lets you um, control how the hardware functions in the computer and there's two really critical pieces here a, you should always have the administrator password set on the BIOS. So unless you have the admin password, you cannot get into the BIOS of the computer. Um, that is critical for two things. Um, the BIOS are unique to every computer. Um, every manufacturer has their own flavor of BIOS and they change can change pretty dramatically from model year to model year. So I can't really give just like, here's how it'll be with all BIOS. It'll really depend on who's made your computer and how old it is. But always set that admin password because that prevents people from getting into the BIOS and messing with things, how the computer works at boot up. And the other thing that's critical to know is in a lot of BIOS systems, that's where they have a, like a factory reset option. So if you get into the BIOS, and then get to that option, you can basically restore the factory um, setup onto the computer and basically reset the whole thing right back to how it was from factory to fault. So if you know your computers are set up with Office and things like that, somebody gets in there, decides to be malicious and does it, then you've got a computer, it's gonna have to be completely reworked. Um, the other thing is boot order, or what's the first boot device. And why that's critical is, um, a lot of the BIOSes now, if you go into the BIOS, it'll offer an option for a boot menu, and that'll let you pick which device you want to boot off of. So in the old days, it used to be, do you want to boot off the floppy? And then it was, do you want to boot off the CD? Well, these days, pretty much everything is set to boot off the USB drive. You see, I've got the little picture there. I've heard them called micro drives, jump drives, um, but USB tends to be pretty much the standard term. And what happens is these days you can actually load up an entire operating system on your USB drive, put it in the USB port, bring up the bent menu and say boot off the USB drive. If you permit somebody to do that and they boot up off their USB drive, they have complete ownership of the computer. They can do anything they want to it. They've completely bypassed any security, anything you have loaded on it. Um, they, can, they can decide to trash it. They can use it for malicious purposes. Um, you may see um, some of the teens for a while there. Um, we had a lot of teenagers who were bringing in boot drives that would allow them to boot up and take control of the machine and, and run their Minecraft instance. So um, again, this should always be done when you get a new computer. If you have existing computers and this has not been done, I can't urge you strongly enough to get that admin password. If you have an admin login set up on the Windows on your computer and you want to make the password that you use for Windows admin the same as you use for the uh, uh, BIOS admin, that's great. That's a good way to keep everything in sync. 
but this is the first critical step that you want to do. Uh, the other thing that you can turn on and off in the BIOS, I'm not sure how many are familiar with this, is Wake on LAN. Um, I worked at libraries where we had um, 40 <clears throat> computers available to the public. And what was nice about Wake on LAN is if these computers were plugged in with a wired connection, um, we actually had enterprise management, which we'll get into later, where we could actually have all our computers, we'd send a signal to them across the network and all of our public computers would just fire up. We didn't have to go around and turn them all on by hand. Uh, mm -hmm. So it saved us a lot of time. It made things really easy for us. Plus, if you've had public computers that are in use and they're getting turned on and off multiple times a day, I've actually had to fix power buttons that wore out over time. So this is wow. a, a neat little feature. <laughs> You know, if you got a couple computers in the library, it's not a big deal. Um, when I was at Papillion as the IT person, I had over 40. Um, in Sydney, we had 10. In Connecticut, we had about 30. So this was a great feature that just saved us a lot of time in the morning. So everyone thinks about the software that needs to be kept up to date, but you had a hardware issue where the button just, the actual physical yeah. button just and, wore out. And we'll get into a slide too where there's some other hardware that there's some workarounds to help maintain it and make it usable mm -hmm. too. But like yeah, I said, so wake on. You mentioned where you worked at because I was going to, yeah, mention that, you know, you do, uh, you're just, you're not just an IT person coming here and telling us what to do. Sherm has extensive I've been an IT guy in, libraries in multiple for public decade. libraries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep, I've kind of seen it all from uh, <laughs> the early days of the PCs to the makerspaces. So. <laughs> so this is just an example of the BIOS. This is just a screenshot. Now, since it's BIOS, I can't actually do like a screenshot. So this is kind of a crappy picture with my iPhone and my BIOS screen on my PC at home. So you can see the administrator password where you can set that in the BIOS. Um, the next screen is what I talked about is UEFI. That's the boot order where it's telling you in what sequence things are going to be looked for. So what happens is like say your hard drive crashes isn't bad. It will then follow, go down this list saying, okay, I can't boot off the hard drive. I'm going to try and boot off the CD DVD drive. Okay, there's nothing loaded there. Now I'm going to try and boot off the USB drive. And so when you install Windows on computers today, we generally download it all onto a bootable USB and that's what you use for install. So if you've got a, a PC whose hard drive is crashed and you put a new hard drive in it or somebody does it for you, they're gonna probably boot off a USB drive to then re to get Windows back on it, Office back on it, and get it back into the state it needs to be to use in the library. So your bio screen, I guarantee you, will look completely different. Um, this is a Hewlett Packard computer that's brand new. And so th this is what the BIOS looks like this month anyway. But they change these things up all the time. So your, your mileage may definitely vary depending on who made the computer and how old it is. So back to hardware thing again. A um, couple of things on the hardware of the computers you're using is I don't know how many of you have issues with people blasting the speakers on the computers in the library. Um, every library I was at, I, did, I disabled the internal speaker. So if you wanted to be able to hear or listen to anything on the computer, you had to bring your own headphones in, or um, at the libraries I work for, we had the headphones you could check out, or we had like cheap little earbuds for sale that we bought super cheap off eBay, and you could buy for two, three dollars a pair. So I always disable the internal speaker. It just does away with the noise issues um, for people coming and using your computer. It keeps things quieter. Um, and laptops, if you're using laptops with the public, you can disable that by those speakers. Generally, there's a feature to disable that in the BIOS. Um, your older desktop computers that still have the speaker in them, usually an option in the BIOS to disable them also. Um, in your desktop computers that are older, if you don't have an option in the BIOS to disable it, a lot of times you can just pull the cover off, spot the speaker, follow the wires, you'll see where it plugs into the motherboard, and you can simply unplug it. And then you never have to worry about um, having somebody blast the speakers in the library again. Uh, the other thing you can do is if you plug in a headphone extension cord into one of the headphone ports on the front or the back, the computer will see that there's a headphone cord in place and a lot of the computers disable the internal speaker once they something is plugged into the headphone jack so there's some different ways there you can turn that off 
Um, the two pictures that I offer the bottom, the left is kind of the old school. That's what they used to put in the computers. Uh, the one on the right is what you'll see today. I know it says speaker, but that's not really a speaker. It's more of a little buzzer now. And it's strictly mm -hmm. used by the BIOS. So if the BIOS is trying to fire up and there's some kind of hardware issue with your computer, you may hear a sequence of buzzes or chirps. That's what those modern speakers do. They're actually not made to deliver sound any longer. Uh, the expectation is pretty much everybody's using uh, a microphone or a headset or speakers with their computer. And even now, today, for example, my new computer I just bought, that little buzzer is not even plugged into the motherboard. It's soldered into the motherboard. It can't, it doesn't come out. You can't unplug it. You can't do anything with it. So just to, to clue you in on that, again, laptops, since they have the built-in speakers, almost all of them have an option in the BIOS where you can turn that off. So again, your users would have to have their headphones on uh, to be able to listen to anything. Um, ports and jacks, as you, the public uses your computers, they will destroy your USB ports and your headphone ports. Um, mm -hmm. That is just going to happen as people jam their headphone plugs in and out of the plug in the front. What I recommend and what I've done in all my libraries is I use extension cables right out of the gate. So on your computers, on the front, you'll have multiple USB ports and a headphone microphone port you have the same ports in the back. And so what I like to do was plug an extension cable for the headphones and the USB in the back of my computers, bring it up through the hole that was cut in the desk where my monitor cables go. And I would have them laying there right underneath the monitor with a label on it that would say headphone and USB. And that would encourage people to use those extension cables rather than on the, the ports on my computers. Uh, they could still use the port on the computer but by having that right there in easy reach right in front of them, and then if you can, if you have your computers kind of slung down, maybe on a sling under the desk or something, where this is an easier reach for them to plug their stuff in, you will maintain the ports on the computers. Because I'm sorry, it just with headphone jacks, they're just going to get busted. In oh, my yeah. experience, they get busted and nothing flat. And then you're in a bad situation where how are we going to do this? Now, modern computers do have Bluetooth. Um, where if you're, you're lending or your customers bring in Bluetooth headphones, that may not be a big deal anymore. But the use of those extension cables, which you can buy super cheap off Amazon or eBay and have them placed. And if somebody screws up the headphone port on your cable, you just go buy another cheapo, plug it in, and your computer's fixed and working again. So if you want to really keep the durability and the use of your computers up, I highly recommend using those extension cables and encouraging their use instead of the actual uh, ports on the computer. So now we're talking about the Windows OS. So I don't know how old the computers are that are out there. Hopefully everybody's pretty much got Windows 10. Um, if you're still running Windows 7 computers, that operating system was is end of life. They haven't been releasing security updates for it. Um, you're putting the people using it at risk. If you're using Windows 7 computers, they need to be um, either if they're capable upgraded in Windows 10, or it's definitely time that they get replaced with new computers. Um, Windows 10, Windows 11 is the current OS. Any new computers you buy will be shipping with Windows 11. Uh, Windows 10 is still supported. And right now, Microsoft is saying the end of life for Windows 10 will be October 2025. That'll probably get extended. That's how it's always worked in the past. But be aware that um, if you're running a Windows 10 computer, now the nice thing, if you've bought a newer Windows 10 computer, it can probably be upgraded to Windows 11, no problem. So you don't have to worry about that. But keep that in mind. You need to be running Windows 10 or 11 in this day and age. When you set up the computer, give it a descriptive name. Um, this gets into if we're going to use some enterprise uh, management software or something to maintain the computers later on. But by giving it a descriptive name, um, you know, so if it's public computer one, public computer two, um, meeting room computer, um, you know, children's area computer, uh, the names are very helpful if you're going to be using anything to kind of watch over them from a PC at the front desk or something. You bring it up. If you leave it the factory name, it's going to be HP and some serial number or something. You're not going to 
really understand which computer it is or where it's located. This also plays into a suggestion I have later on about um, using banner separator pages when you print because the computer name is what will be dropped onto that banner separator page. So give it a descriptive name. The nice thing is you can change computer names whenever you want. So if you remodel or move things around a library and it's a different area or a different purpose, you can go in and rename uh, that computer to, to uh, keep it accurate for where it is and what it's being used for. When you first set up a computer, um, it will prompt you to set up a login. Um, and then Microsoft will also prompt you to set up a Microsoft account and a PIN for it. Um, you can skip that. They may make you say, yes, I want to skip this multiple times because they really want you to set up a Windows login to use with the computer. But at this time, it's still not required. And for public computers, you don't want it turned on. You want to strictly stick with a, a user login in Windows. The other thing I will caution you about is that initial login you set up when you're setting up a new computer is set up as administrator. So mm -hmm. if you set up your computer as public and you set up, you know, your initial user is public and you don't go back and activate the administrator account and, ch and, and set passwords, um, that login then, if somebody sits down on the computer, they have administrator rights, which again, lets them do whatever they want to that computer. They can install software, they can change things, and that becomes real critical, um, especially with security stuff, which I'll give a plug for July, when we'll talk about um, filtering that uses DNS. If I have administrator rights, I can go bring it, if I know how to do it, I can bring up the DNS settings of the computer, change them, and I'm bypassing all the filtering that you have in place if you're an E-rate SIPA compliant library. So make sure that you're, um, when you set up that initial login, uh, maybe you set it up as staff, it's so staff has an administrator login, and then you go back and create it, the user public, and then you can make, like whatever user you want your default when the computer boots up, you can make the public login your default. So it wouldn't have a password or anything, it just comes up right up to the, the main way of the screen the way you want. The other thing is, is Windows, um, when you create your, first fire up the PC and create that initial login, that is the only user login on the computer. Um, Windows has the ability where the administrator account is actually on the computer, it's just not active. So I recommend to everybody they go out, uh, it's very quick and easy uh, to activate the administrator login, and then that's the login you can use to um, add, add software, things to the computer. If you prefer to create a staff login with administrator rights and that's your procedure, that's fine too. But if you activate that administrator login, then you've got what you need to be able to maintain the computer. Um, when you create that initial login for public, make sure it's a standard user. The big difference between having being a standard user and administrator is if they try and install software. So when Windows, when you try and install new software, you get a little pop-up window that says, do you really want to install the software? If you're the administrator, you just click yes and it does it. If you're the set up as a standard user, and you click yes, it then prompts you for the administrator password. If you don't have the administrator password, you can't install any software on the computer. And that is a good thing. Uh, you will have patrons coming in that want to do stuff. Um, the one I used to run into a lot was there used to be this really popular um, coupon program that customers would come to the library to print their coupons with. And the computer, that, that coupon program was a known piece of malware. It did print legitimate coupons, but it started tracking the PC and things like that. And we would, mm -hmm. I would tell customers, no, we're not going to install that. Um, Google Earth is another one. You may have it installed on your computers. Uh, it was popular, but mm -hmm. then that's another app you'll have to do updates with later on. So if it doesn't get a lot of use, you, again, that's something that somebody will go to install Google Earth, they'll ask your administrator password, they'll come at the desk and says, hey, I want to put Google Earth on this computer. Can I have the administrator password? And I've seen libraries where the staff just gives them the administrator password <laughs> to install stuff like that. And that's a bad practice. Um, turn off auto updates. Um, this comes into a big play. We're going to talk about reboot and restore software. Uh, the other bad thing about auto updates is they can kick off at any time. Uh, you do not want your public computers, people coming to use the computer and they're loading auto updates 
Uh, they can take a long time and that computer is out of use while that auto update is taking place. Um, if you're using Reboot Restore software, which we'll talk about in a little bit, if that auto update kicks off, it loads all the updates and the computer gets re rebooted, guess what? It thinks again now that it needs to run the updates and you can get your computer in a loop where you reboot it, comes up, oh, I need to load updates, and then it reboots and then it comes up and it says, oh, I need to load updates and it just gets stuck in that loop um, because of the reboot restore software. Uh, Windows Defender antivirus, um, a lot of the PCs you buy these days come with what we call bloatware, which a key one of them tends to be um, the McAfee antivirus, where it's the free trial version, and I recommend that you immediately go out and remove it. Uh, it's money you don't need to spend, it greatly slows your computer down, and uh, I think the Windows Defender antivirus uh, is just fine. Uh, it does a good job, and if you've got that combined with the reboot and store software like you should have, um, you've got a pretty bulletproof computer, and I just don't see the need to spend a lot of money on um, another uh, outside vendor's uh, antivirus software. Uh, the Windows Defender will do a good job. Um, printers, a couple things about printers. Uh, if your library offers black and white and color printing and you charge different rates for it, uh, it, this can get to be an issue with customers where they, they print something they, and they meant it to be in black and white, but for some reason it, they printed color and they don't want to pay. Say your black and white is 10 cents a page, your color is 25 cents a page, and they don't want to pay for the color even though they selected it and printed it. Uh, one of the things I found that worked really good at my libraries is even if it's the same printer, I actually set up the printer is defaulted to black and white and the printer defaulted to color. So they look like two separate printers on the computer. And then the, the default printer was the one set to do just black and white. And then we would have instructions on if you wanna print color, select the color printer. And you can give your printers um, custom names too. So we would have black and white printer, and color printer. So it was very easy for the customers to select whether they wanted black and white or color printing. They didn't have to like bring up the printer and go into preferences and know how to switch it to color. It just did it on the fly depending which printer they selected. And that brings me to my other thing with printing. Some libraries have print management software where you have to come up to the desk and they have to release the job and stuff. So they make sure they get paid for however many pages you're printing. Um, a lot of smaller libraries, maybe don't have that, want that expense or complication. Um, having that kind of printing stuff in place is confusing to customers. I understand why we do it. In my large libraries, we had that in place uh, to make sure that you know we got paid for the printing the computers, the customers are doing. But what you can do in a smaller library is Windows has the ability where you can turn on what we call a banner or a separator page. Uh, this is a great function, even if you're using maybe some of the print management software where every print job that gets sent to the printer will print that banner separator page. And if you remember, if we go in our computers a descriptive name, um, so if we're using the same public login on every computer, but our computer has a descriptive name, that computer name will be printed on that banner separator page. So you know which computer um, that print job came from. Um, at my large libraries where we had rows and rows of computers, um, people could come up and say, I've got a you know print job to go. And first thing we'll say is which computer you're on. They never know which computer they were on. They have to turn around and look and see the big tag sticking off the top of the computer monitor, which reminds them which computer they were on. And then when that, if you've got people printing multiple jobs at the same time to the printer, that banner page is nice because it gives you a separation between those print jobs. So hopefully people aren't digging through other people's stuff you know, to find what they printed. Uh, that banner separator page gives you that. If you're a library where the printer's behind the desk and it's a busy library and you're getting multiple print jobs coming off the printer, this allows you to separate them out, kind of stack them up. You can even keep a running page count, you know, with a pencil on the separator page. So when they're done and they're ready to come to pay, you've got the total and everything right there for them. Uh, so they can pay for their prints and head out the door. Uh, the Windows desktop background, this is super valuable to use for signage. 
you ever been in the libraries and they have all this signage piled up between their computers for how much printing and that costs, uh, the, you could do a custom background on our computer. I'll show you that. So this is what I did at the Sydney Public Library. This was the background screen on all of our computers. So if you sat down at the computer, um, this is what you would see on the initial screen. So talked about, gave a warning. Again, this is our enterprise software that if you didn't use the mouse for the keyboard for 15 minutes, the computer would automatically reboot, had our printing pricing, um, how to select between black and white color, our rules on drinks and eats, headphones, a warning that our computer shut down before close. We highly recommended that you use a USB drive. If you're using reboot and store software and the computer reboots on somebody and they're not saving their work, they're gonna lose their work. And then um, we would ask people to minimize use the phone. Another useful line that's nice to have on here that we did at my Connecticut library was we had, um, by using this computer, you've accept all of our terms and conditions for the use of this computer. And that would be on this screen. So if they came up to complain, hey, I didn't know you were gonna charge me for printing or this or that, you can basically say, hey, you see that screen that was on the computer we set down? By using this computer, you've acknowledged our terms and conditions, and yeah, you'll have to pay for your prints, you know, just like everybody else. That was one of the common arguments that I got to deal with. Um, wired or Wi-Fi connection, um, you know, your older buildings, you've probably run Ethernet cabling everywhere for the network. Newer libraries, everybody's gone to Wi-Fi. Either one works fine if you've got good Wi-Fi network performance, um, but what I would do is consider how your printer's hooked up. Um, some libraries have some, maybe running some of the old printers. Um, I had, at Sydney, I had a Hewlett Packard laser printer that was 10 years old, ran like a champ, no need to spend the money, but it was a little behind in the features. It didn't support Wi-Fi printing. It only supported wired printing. And so it was, depending on how you set your network up, your Wi-Fi connected computer should still be able to print to it. But if all your computers are plugged in, um, that may make your printing, printing setup easier or harder. It just depends. A little plug there on when you set your printer up for your computer network. Um, we have, you have the ability to call what we call static IP addresses. One of the things I always recommend is your printer should always be assigned a static IP address. And then when you set up and configure the printing on your computers, use TCP IP to that printer it just saves a lot of trouble, save you a lot of hassle with printing issues. We talked about bloatware, that could be the McAfee stuff, that could be games, um, all kinds of different stuff. It's whoever wrote the manufacturer check to have their software pre-installed on the computer to annoy the heck out of you, to here's your free trial, here's your free trial, hey, you're running out of your free trial, send us a check, blah, blah, blah. You can actually go into the apps and remove a lot of that stuff so it's not popping up. That'll just annoy your customers and confuse them too. So definitely get that bloatware removed. Um, Bluetooth, uh, this is something we've talked about. You, um, you can enable it that way if the customer brings in their own Bluetooth headphones or something like that, they can connect and use them. Uh, some people might mention, you know, the security issue of having Bluetooth enabled, but if you've got your reboot restore software, your antivirus software, the thing's all locked down, uh, you should be fine. And if you want to offer that convenience to, I mean, almost everybody's got Bluetooth headphones, it seems like anymore, AirPods, anything like that, they could use them with your computer if the Bluetooth's enabled. Um, start up the browser on boot. Again, this depends on what works best for your library. I like to just have the window come up, the computer come up the, at the Windows um, screen with my custom desktop screen that explained all our terms and conditions and prices. Um, some people know their customers sit down and all they care about when they set the computer is they want the Google search page. So you may wanna have Chrome just fire up from default and give you the default Google screen with you know, what you're gonna search and do you feel lucky today? Uh, it might save some time. Uh, again, something I like to do at my libraries is when you launch the browser, we would have the default home screen be the library's website. So if we had events and things coming up that were all um, on our website, anytime somebody sat down on a computer library and fired up Chrome or, or uh, Edge, the first website that would come up by default was the library's website where we could advertise and, and promote all that stuff. Uh, automatic shutdown of PCs. 
Um, every library that I've gone to, uh, they didn't have this in, in, incorporated, and I was a big hero for turning it on because nobody likes to argue with customers that we have to close, it's closing time, you need to get off the computer. Um, I have had customers get violent with me when um, it was time to get off the computer and go home. So turning, you can, there's numerous ways you can do this. Since we're talking about the Windows OS, it has a feature called Task Scheduler. You can actually go in and set up a task schedule where your computers automatically will shut down five minutes before close, 10 minutes before close. And sometimes as the administrator on the computer, you would have the ability to block it. Uh, my recommend, what I always train my staff to do was just say, I'm sorry, this is security software our IT guys put in place. We have no ability to stop this process from happening. The computer is going to shut down, save your work, have a good night. So great, great feature to have. It just saves you from having to deal with some negative interactions there uh, with your customers. Another nice to have is the Adobe Reader is default. Um, a lot of your browsers these days uh, have that duty where if you fire up a PDF file, um, Chrome will automatically load it up into a tab in Chrome. What's nice about having the Adobe Reader loaded and set as your default PDF viewers, it makes printing a lot easier. Um, I've seen PDFs that get pulled up into the page on Google and then they go to print it and it does really bizarre things. It doesn't print out right. Uh, but if you're using the Adobe Reader, I've never had printing issues. It's always worked really, really well. Uh, one question you may get is people come in and want to edit Adobe PDF, PDF files. Adobe Reader is a free reader. All you can do is read the PDF. If you want to actually be able to edit PDF files, then you have to have Acrobat. That's a paid for program. And we'll mention that here. We get towards the end of the presentation. There's a few issues with offering that. Again, there's the screen we talked about, which I always liked using at my libraries. And now we'll get on to browsers. So. Uh, the three major browsers out there if you're running a Windows PC is Chrome, Edge, or Firefox. Um, I've seen libraries where all three browsers are available, so it's whatever the customer wants to use or likes to use. You know, if they have a, a Google account, a Microsoft account, or a um, Firefox account. I will caution you, though, that if you're using the Reboot Restore software, that's three browsers you have to manually run the updates on. So Google owns 63% of the market. I think you need to have Chrome on the computer. Um, Edge is there by default with Windows. You can make it go away, but it's not really worth the effort. Um, some people still quit Edge with being an Internet Explorer, so it's probably good to have it there. Firefox is only 3% of the market. Again, if you have customers that request it or like it, you know your customer base and you wanna have it installed on the computer, great, go ahead. If it was me and I have to do the updates on the computer once a month, I wouldn't put the Firefox on because that's just one more browser I'm going to have to run updates for. Bookmarks and favorites. So if you're familiar with setting up bookmarks on Chrome or favorites in Edge, if you have common websites that you know your, your customers go to, um, you can set those up as bookmarks. So when the customer fires at the browser and they're seeing the computer, they can see you could have Yahoo Mail, you could have... Um, Outlook, you could have those just set as, as bookmarks where they can just click on it and get right to the email they want or the website they want. Maybe you have the school's website saved as a bookmark. So if you know your customer base, you know where they like to go, um, you can offer that as some convenient stuff. Uh, website shortcuts on the desktop. I'm not sure how many people are aware of this. You can create a shortcut to a website on the desktop just like you can a shortcut to an app. So mm -hmm. if people um, want to launch the browser, sometimes your customers don't understand a browser. They don't understand the difference between Firefox, Chrome, mm -hmm. and um, Edge. So I'm a big Chrome fan. So I used to have my Chrome shortcut, browser shortcut on the desktop. And I called it where it would install it and say it was Chrome. I would rename it to internet. So people would like sit down and they would see they didn't care that it had the Chrome logo on it. They just saw internet, would click it, and get on with their life. Uh, I wouldn't get called over to say, okay, how do I get to the internet? Well, you launch your browser. Well, what's a browser? Okay, let me show you how this works. But if they see something that says internet, they just click on it, 
and they get on with their lives. It works really, really well. MS Office is probably the most commonly installed app on any of the library's public computers. Um, for, sure, I want to back up since you were talking about browsers and, and what I do have a question about them. Um, is there any difference? You talked about which has the most of the market share. Google, of course, is, yeah. is you know, um, and that Firefox is perfectly fine. Is there any difference security wise between the different browsers, Edge, Google, Edge, Chrome and they Firefox that anyone should be worried about? The same features, because as soon as somebody creates a new feature that's hot, everybody else copies it. So yeah. there's not really any um, kind of leading edge as far as security. Now, there is a browser called Duck, Duck, Goose. I don't know if people yes. are familiar with that. Um, if you're big on offering an amenity to your users as they surf and run around the internet, um, Duck, Duck, Goose is a browser that was created to provide that. They don't do any tracking or anything like mm -hmm. that. Um, Firefox has kind of gone that direction too, where they say your browsing is anonymous or it has a feature you can turn on. Um, Google sort of does it, but they really make a lot of money off your information where you went, so it's not really very robust. So there may be some situations where maybe Firefox or you want to install DuckDuckGoose so you're um, offering some anonymity to your patrons and customers when they're using your computers at the library. Mm -hmm. But really security-wise, there's not anything there's that's not cutting. Difference anymore, yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. MS Office, if you don't have a TechSoup.org membership for your library, it mm -hmm. is free. It will save you a fortune. Mm -hmm. You can get MS mm -hmm. Office from TechSoup for 30 bucks a copy. You will not awesome. find I that love price TechSoup. anywhere yeah, I highly, else. I highly recommend it for um, everyone to use when we have libraries that um, apply for grants with us to get software or computers or whatever. We say, go to TechSoup, don't go anywhere else. <laughs> Yeah, um, they have all the flavors of Microsoft Office. Standard is fine. You know, it used to be a big deal to make Pro available because of the access database. In all my time at the libraries, for over the 10 years I've worked there, I've had one customer ask me about access. <laughs> so I, it just doesn't get used. Save your money, go with the standard version. I, I just don't see anybody um, really needing to offer access and option to your customers. Again, you know your community, maybe you've got one of your regulars that does use it, but um, I think as long as you're offering Word, Excel, PowerPoint, um, you pretty much got your bases covered. Um, one thing I'll caution you is Microsoft has made the local install in Office a real pain in the butt. Um, they'll keep prompting you to sign up for Office 365 as you go through the install process. You don't want to do that. You want the Office app locally installed so it does not require a Microsoft login to get out and do stuff. Um, you can, when you download that from TechSoup, you, it'll be a file. You can build a bootable USB drive, put it on there and use it to do the installs. When you fire up to do the install, do the custom install and do not install the OneNote or Outlook. And let me explain why. So OneNote is kind of a uh, a workforce software, messaging software. So these are public computers used by individuals. There's really no need for it. Um, and when you install it, it'll switch some of your file defaults. It might cause confusion. Um, if you have the Outlook client from Office installed on your computer, it will make it the kind of the default for email. Again, nobody's gonna be using the like, enterprise outlook like we worked at a business so don't install it everybody's going to be using the browser to do their email if you install the outlook if they do any options where it prompts like for your email if the outlook client is there it'll launch and come up the screen telling them to create an outlook account it just causes confusion so do not install it once the office is installed um, you will activate it with the office key that you will get from microsoft you have to have an account with Microsoft if you're using TechSoup that lets you go out and, and see the uh, installation keys that you have with Office through the TechSoup process. Um, app shortcuts on the desktop and taskbar. Again, I really recommend having the shortcut for Word, Excel, uh, PowerPoint, not only as a desktop, but you can add them to the taskbar at the bottom of the screen. So they're right there where people can click at them and get on them and just makes it a lot easier and saves the questions. Um, 
uh, yeah. going back to the the browsers. Um, yeah, somebody just commented, and I remembered that too. It's actually Duck Duck Go. Oh, I'm sorry, Duck Duck Go. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was thinking Duck Duck Goose. Yeah, of course, duck, have it. Duck, yeah. duck, go. <laughs> Um, okay, the reboot restore software. I have seen a lot of libraries that do not have this in place. I think you're just doing your community huge disservice. This is such an important piece of the security software to have on your public use computers. What reboot restore software is, is once you have your PC configured the way you want your public to utilize it, you then install and activate the reboot and restore software. What the software does is after somebody has come in and used the computer and then it gets rebooted, whatever they've done to it, whatever they've done on it gets wiped out and it's back to your pristine configuration. This is a must have if you're going to offer public computers. Um, I've had libraries say, well, when somebody's done using a computer, we go over and manually blow away the history and stuff like that. It's not good enough. This should be there. Um, there's various solutions out there. Um, I noticed on our survey we had libraries reporting, reporting their Reboot Restore software is the filter software. Reboot Restore software is not a filter. It does not do that. So if you don't have filtering in place and you're an E-rate library, um, we're going to be doing the July 26th show. We're going to talk all about filtering or if you want to give me a ring and we can talk about it. But if you think your reboot resource software is acting as your filter for SIPA compliance, it is not, it does not do that. Uh, there used to be a process back in the Windows 7 days, Windows 95 days, Microsoft had a thing called steady state where you could go through, make a bunch of configuration changes to Windows and it would give you this capability. Um, Microsoft dropped that because Pharonix Deep Trees actually held the patents to a lot of how that worked to secure the Windows operating system. And they were gonna force Microsoft to pony up a license for every copy of Windows they sold if they were gonna offer steady state. So Windows dropped steady state, and now you have to use a, a third-party software package. I'm a huge fan of Deep Freeze. I've never had any issues with it. It's always worked. Um, I've used Centurion Smart Shield. Again, it's worked pretty well. I've run into issues with it when I do a version upgrade. It seems like it always breaks the enterprise console that goes with it, and I have to get them involved to fix it. Uh, Fortress Grian, I ran into that in my early days. Uh, had a terrible time with it. It didn't work. I would have find people's resumes and banking information still on computers because the clean slate didn't do what it was supposed to do. I worked and worked and worked with their tech support trying to figure out what the problems were with it. And when I finally got a uh, new budget year coming up, we wiped it all out and replaced it with deep freeze and never had a problem again. I haven't used the clean slate product in years. Maybe it's gotten fixed, but I had such terrible experience with it. Um, I, I, yeah, I just, didn't like it, didn't care for it. And if, if I had to pick the one wind vendor whose product I, I think is solid and we're well worth the money is Deep Freeze. This is where we get into updates. So if you're um, loading updates on your computer, and again, just like with Windows, we can turn off the auto updates. You can turn off the auto updates on Adobe Reader, on all your browsers. So the somebody fires up Chrome, it doesn't stop run an update for a minute or two until they can use the computer. So then what you have to do is once a month, you have to go to those computers, unfreeze them with the password you set up to do that, the administrator password for that free software. And then you have to load all your updates. Once all your updates are loaded, then you can refreeze the computer again. So just, I've seen libraries where they have the uh, reboot and restore software in place and they don't understand that that's gonna block their updates from taking um, if the computer is what we can call a frozen or locked state. So make sure you're aware of that. Um, Deep Freeze and Smart Shield both offer an enterprise console management option. Um, they used to be bundled with it. I think Deep Freeze charges an additional cost if you want to use enterprise with their Deep Freeze client. I think Smart Shield still might be a freebie. Um, what this does is it's an app you can load on one of your computers at the desk, at the front desk, and then you use, again, we talked about static IP addresses. You make sure that computer has a static IP address, and then when you install the, the Deep Freeze or the Smart Shield client on the computers, 
you give them that IP address and they will now talk to that console software. And what's cool about it is you can bring up the administrator or enterprise console up on your front desk computer and you have complete control over your public computers. You can reboot them, you can turn them off, you can unfreeze them. Um, Deep Freeze has some pretty significant um, applications where you can actually, if you're using, so if you've had a large environment like I used to support, I would use Deep Freeze to actually send the wake on LAN, wake all my computers up in the middle of the night, unfreeze them, run the scripts that land all my updates, and then refreeze them and reboot them. So when we came in the morning, all the updates were done. It was completely automated. It was really, really super cool. Um, but again, a lot of them have the ability to also where you can automate um, from the enterprise console, you can say at this time, shut all these computers down, or you can, when it's five minutes before close, you can let every library know, hey, the library is closing in five minutes, and the, or at 10 minutes close, hey, the library is closing in 10 minutes, at five minutes all the computers will shut down. You can bring up the console and send the command to shut all the computers down at five minutes till close and they won't be able to stop it. So you don't wind up having to deal with people who won't get off the computer when it's time to go home. So some really, really good features there you can take advantage of. Um, if you have public computers that have been in use and do not have Reboot Restore software on them, um, I'm gonna be harsh, but shame on you. Um, you're putting your customers at risk. They should not ever be allowed to run that way. If you're gonna get out and get your Reboot Restore software, uh, be aware that I would consider any computer that's been out there in use as compromised. It would need to be factory reset and set up from scratch with the reboot restore software put in place. So I'm, I'm sorry that's kind of a hard line, but I'm really looking out you know, for your customer's best interest and making sure they're as protected as possible. Again, public computers are a unique thing and we need to make sure that we're setting them up so they're safe and secure. Uh, Couple other item, items, cloning PCs. If you have a large number of computers to set up, you can set up kind of a, your base hard drive, what we call your image, and make a copy of it. And then you can replicate it onto as many hard drives and computers as you want, which makes when you're buying a large number of new computers, or if you have a computer crash and you need to re reload the hard drive or get a new hard drive in it, if you have that image saved on a USB or a backup hard drive, it's very easy to get a computer back up and running. Um, the other thing that's super popular, a package I really liked at my libraries was Time Limiter. Um, this is where Fortress Grand, I will give them big kudos, their Time Limit Manager software is really cool. So if you are a very busy library and you wanna restrict people to how long they can use the computer and not like keeping hand notes to the desk for, okay, this person got on the computer at 8.05 and then it's up to you. So somebody comes in and says, hey, I need a computer, they're all busy. What this does is you can set the time limit on the PC. So people have an hour to use the computer, they have two hours to use the computer, and then you can do it either ticket or ticket list. What that means is it has the app has the ability to print out tickets. So they come to the desk, you give them a ticket that has a code on it, they have to go sit down on the computer, put the code in, and then they have use of that computer for an hour. Once the hour is up, um, they would have to come back to the desk and get another ticket to use it for another hour. So if you have people waiting for them, it's a great solution. Um, you can do it ticketless where they don't have to get tickets, but you can still set the time limit on it um, if you want. The other thing that I see get missed a lot for libraries that have time limit manager is it provides fantastic usage stats on your computers. If you have time limit um, manager in place and you can actually see how much use your computers are getting, it will tell you for every computer, it's getting used this many minutes a day, it had this many logins, blah, blah, blah. It will give you an average overall that you can say our, our computer use on average is this many minutes of the day. Um, when you're having to do funding requests and things like that, that kind of data can be invaluable where you can ex tell you know, your city council or your county board or whoever your funding organization is, you can you know, show how heavily these used and how important they are for your community. Super statistics there. Um, if anybody is has the, uh, um, what are the kids' computers I'm trying to think of now? I'm 
the awe computers ah uh, yep, yep i will mention this they have a great statistics reporting package built into them too that a lot of people don't know about that you can log in as the administrator on your awe computer and you can go out and you can pull a report for how much they're being used Great. Um, the users training like i said i can't believe how many times people say what's a browser that's a great training opportunity for them um, printing is kind of, in my opinion, become the killer app for libraries. I know I don't have printers at home anymore. How many of you have an inkjet printer that you don't use for six months and then you go to use it and the print heads are all dried out and clogged up and they're going to go make you pay a hundred bucks for new ink cartridges so you can print a couple pages. Um, I, everybody goes to the library to print anymore. Um, so having your printing, however you do it, making sure it's as robust and as frictionless as possible. Um, gets your makes your customers happy, gets them in and out of the door. Kids will want access to Roblox and the Minecraft Classic. So they're going to come in after school. They're going to play games. I guarantee you these are the two games they're going to want to play. Should be fine. You shouldn't have any issues. Um, this is where the Reboot Restore software comes into place. So if a kid puts Roblox on the computer, it actually drops some files out there. And if they are done with the computer and you don't have their Reboot Restore, Somebody else that comes in has access to the Roblox stuff. So just something to know. A lot of libraries I've seen doing Chromebooks, just like schools, because they're very simple and very affordable. Um, Google has a whole admin console that allows you to lock those down and manage them. Um, it's pretty robust. One thing I'll say my Chromebook experience is Google seems to think nobody prints anymore. <laughs> they just store, store everything out on your Google Drive. Um, so I've had lots of printing issues with Chromebooks. You set it up, you get it working, and then it seems like two days later it breaks again. So I don't know what your experience has been, but if you're thinking Chromebooks, um, make sure you have a Windows PC you can print from because I, I've run into way too many issues printing from Chromebooks. Um, iPads, uh, when I was with Papillion, we had iPads all through our children's area. I actually bought a used little iMac to be able to run the administrator console for those that allow you to lock them down and control them and stuff. Um, so again, if that's something you want to offer, uh, look into the Apple School Manager uh, to to main to manage those devices in that. Um, signage, your users should always know up front what their printing cost is. If you're using the reboot reset software, make sure they're aware that if that computer gets rebooted, their work will be lost and they should be saving to a USB drive. That's bad, you have a power outage, the computers all go down, that's too bad. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've had somebody come to the library, spend all day on a computer and leave, and then they come back the next day, even though we have all the signage that says what's gonna happen, and they expect all their work to still be on that computer they used all day the day before. I, it's not your personal that, computer. It yeah, it it's happens. A public I mean, computer. We can only do so much. Um, closing time and shutdown warning. So if you have automated your shutdown, um, make sure that you give a warning five minutes before so people are aware that, hey, in five minutes, this computer is turning off, no ands, ifs, or buts, and make sure they have the warning. Again, I really like the use of the Windows desktop, create a custom desktop screen you can set in Windows that gives all that information. And then again, I, I really like the default website to the library's website. So if you have a lot of programming and stuff going on that you have the advertising on your website, or a lot of libraries don't use a website anymore, they've moved to Facebook, make your Facebook page the default screen when the browser first gets fired up. So again, we're that's again, I can't tout how useful this has been to me over the years to do that custom uh, desktop screen. Maintenance. Um, Use the Windows admin login for all your maintenance. Anything changes you make as the administrator rolls through the whole computer. So then if somebody logs in as public, or if you have other logins on the computer, if I've updated everything as the administrator, everybody gets those updates. Uh, in Windows OS, the auto updates in Windows, the well, manual updates you'll load, because you should have the reboot and restore in place, will op always update Office and Edge in addition to Windows. Um, Chrome browsers have their own update. Adobe Reader has its own update. Pretty much any other apps you load will have their own updates that need to be kicked off and run. What I would do is when it was my um, 
monthly date, I would just put an out order sign on five of my computers. If I was kicking updates off manually, run, take them out of service, run all the updates on them, put them back into service, and move my signs to the next five computers and run the updates and stuff on them um, during the day. You know when your slow times are, if you have slow times, sometimes we don't, mm -hmm. um, but make sure you get those um, updates run once a month. I, I have got a lot of question about cleaning computers, especially during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, my rule has always been no food. It's just disgusting. I can't believe anybody would want to sit at a public computer and eat but I see it all the time and it just makes me want to barf. So that's why I have my little barf logo there. Um, we had a guy who used to come in with cream cheese and bagels and be licking his fingers and using the keyboard. Uh. It was the most disgusting and he did it. Every single day I'd have to go over and have the convert food conversation with him. And so um, when that person comes in and uses the computer and leaves, um, clean the keyboards, um, disinfecting spray and wipes work fine. Um, in the old school days, um, Back when I was doing call centers, we actually used to run keyboards through the dishwasher because we'd have mm -hmm. so many to clean. So, uh, but this day, these days, do just doing the cleaning keyboards with your spray it and wipe it or just use a disinfecting wipe, you're good to go. Um, cleaning screens, I get a lot of questions about that. Some libraries spend a lot of money on the special um, cleaning towelettes made for screens. What's mm -hmm. always worked for me is just a soft cloth and some warm water. It does just a good a job. It, true, it doesn't necessarily disinfect the screen, um, but it, it does get the smudges and stuff off of it. Uh, getting gunk out of the keyboard when it happens, having that can of compressed air is great for blowing keyboards clean. Um, every year I recommend that you disconnect your computer and take it outside and pop the cover off, especially if they sit on the floor with the carpet, they will ingest a lot of dust and dirt. Um, if you have a home computer and you have pets, you may be wanting to do this every three or four months. Take it outside, hit it with the compressed air, blow everything out. Um, mm -hmm. You can use, a, the problem with the vacuum though is a lot of times the dust is kind of stuck to it. So if you hit it with the compressed air, that loosens everything up. And if you still have big clods of stuff in there, once it's loosed up with the compressed air, you can carefully take the vacuum and suck everything clean. Um, that's important because computers, their whole cooling system is based on not being clogged full of dust. And if your computer gets all clogged up with dust, that can cause the computers to overheat and cause damage. So once a year, do what we call periodic maintenance, take them outside, blow all the dust out of them and bring them back side and set them back up. Uh, we have a question. Is there, um, a, I know there are special vacuums for doing that for com on computers. Is I that just, necessary to I buy something my, special? Yeah, I, I just use my shop vac with my narrow tube attachment on the end to suck dust mm -hmm. out of them. Really, the compressed air is the best thing. That'll blow mm -hmm. everything loose and get it loose. So then you can come in with the vac and vacuum up. Mm -hmm. Those little mini vacuums and stuff you can buy, I mean, if you want to, great. They work just as well. But if you've got a shop vac, or even a floor vac that's got the hose attachment, you're mm -hmm. good to go. It'll mm -hmm. do just as good a job. Cool. Um, I wanna jump in here and say, let everyone know we are a little after 11 o'clock, that's okay. Um, we started a little after 10. And um, if anyone has any questions, get them into your question section there, typed in so we can get them answered before we, we, um, we wrap things up. Um, but we will go as long as it takes for Sherman to get through all of his slides, get all of his information out for you. And it looks like we're on the last slide possibly. We're on the last slide. Yeah. And any questions you do have, I want to make sure we answer for you uh, before we end things today. So get your questions in so we get them um, taken care of for you. Um, I get a lot of question about buying used PCs. If you're a tech suit person, you see refurb PCs offered all the time, mm -hmm. 300 bucks. The problem is those computers tend to be five years old already. I'm not a big fan of used computers. Um, I mean, if that's all you can afford and they're, you know, your computer is 10 years old, a computer that's only five years old is definitely an improvement, but if as cheap as computers are these days, if you can get a grant or get the funding, get a brand new computer. I, I just don't see at this day and age, it's worth wasting the money on used computers. Um, I did inherit a library from a gentleman who believed in buying all his own parts and building his own computers. I referred to them as the Frankensteins because they were all different and it was a real pain 
to maintain them. Um, so I just <laughs> I just don't see the cost advantage into building your own computers anymore. If you're building a high end gaming rig, maybe. But for just base computers, office you know office class computers, you're going to use in the library. I just don't see the cost savings anymore to buying all the components and building your own. Or if you have somebody in your library that's all eager to build computers for you, just go with the off-the-shelf Dell, HP, Lenovo. Um, generally, when you buy them, you get a one-year warranty and that with them too. So uh, I, I just don't see the name really buying used or building your own these days. Uh, I get questions about, should I have a UPS on the computers? It's great because the UPS offers fantastic power protection, but again, they built computers to be pretty rock solid. I do recommend possibly on one of your front desk computers having a UPS. So if you have a power outage, if you also have a UPS on the, your networking gear, it will keep that all up and available so you can still use your front desk computer to check books in and out and things like that as long as the UPS has the battery power to support it. So that's a nice thing to have. Um, just a little uh, deal I'm gonna throw out there is if you have a notebook computer and you have a power outage, remember your, your notebook laptop computers have a battery in them. Mm -hmm. If you can fire one up at the front desk and have a barcode reader on it and run off that battery, maybe your networking gear you didn't have UPS on so you can't get to your ILS out in the cloud, um, your catalog system, fire up Notepad and scan the barcodes into Notepad. So scan their card, their library card note barcode, then scan their books barcode, hit enter, leave a blank line and do the next one. The cool thing then is when your catalog or ILS comes back up and is available or your vendor has an outage, um, you can just cut and paste those barcodes in and get caught up. It's a lot easier than trying to hand write out all the numbers and enter in the numbers by hand because you'll write stuff down wrong or you'll make mistakes typing it back in. Um, my daughters give me crap because I've been a computer guy for way too many years now and I still am a terrible typer. Actually, I'm pretty fast. My style is considered grungy. So um, being able to just copy and paste the numbers over because I scanned the barcodes in the notebook works great. Um, some ILSs might have a, an offline mode that allow you to store it as a file that you can then suck back in, but I haven't seen many that do that. So that mm -hmm. notebook, I just want to throw that out there. That notepad is a great little tip to check stuff in and out when your ILS or maybe you're having a, is down or you're having a power outage. Um, I had mentioned Acrobat. So Adobe has Creative Suite. Um, you can get a discount through TechSoup. Adobe makes it still makes it a pain in the butt. You have to have a credit card on file. If you don't do your tech soup, tech soup workout before years up, they auto charge your card for the next version at full price. Um, it's expensive. It has to have a login, an Adobe login, to be able to use it. You used to be able to just install it on the computer and anybody could use it. Now, if customers come in and want to use it, you have to give them the login to the Adobe account to be able to do it. And they have the ability to screw with your account settings because they have a login to the account. So uh, I, I really liked having Adobe available to our people, but Adobe, it seems like every iteration, they make it harder and harder to really support in a public use environment. But again, you know your community and what they want for apps and things to use. So um, I'll throw it out there. It may be something where you don't have to pay for it on every computer. Maybe you just have one computer that has the Adobe suite. And um, if somebody comes in and needs to do edit PDFs, wants to use Photoshop, wants to use um, the cool Adobe apps, maybe you have make a computer available to do that. But there's some, that, that requirement for that login and that account is a real limiter these days, I think, on it. Mm -hmm. um, lending, headphones and USB drives. Um, if you buy the big school style, they still make the headphones that we had when I was in school back as a kid with our tape players and, and stuff. They're pretty much indestructible. They still are. Um, if you want to loan headphones, that's fine. When they come back to the desk, make sure you use a sanitary wipe and wipe them all down um, before you hand them out to the next person. Um, USB drives. A lot of libraries may have a USB drive behind the desk. They will use to assist customers. They don't really recommend just handing them out. Um, you can buy USB drives in bulk 
on Amazon and eBay super cheap, and you can make two gig, four gig USB drives available to your customers. And you can sell them for a buck or two a piece and cover your cost. Um, when I was doing a lot of assistance with people's resumes and cover letters and that that came in the library, I had a pool, a kitty of USB drives where if they came in and didn't have one, I would give them one for free that they could store their resume and their references and their cover letters on that would, as I walked them through the process of how to do cut and paste and complete job applications and stuff online. And they really seemed to appreciate that. You know, where I said, let's get, um, here's a free USB drive. You could even order them with your library's logo on them if you want. Um, yeah. But uh, they're very affordable to just have to sell or even if you want to give them away. Um, laptops and tablets, sending those out the door. I wasn't a big fan because we actually had, uh, when the libraries I had tried it, we had laptops and tablets that came back so inundated with cigarette smoke that we couldn't get the stink out of them to loan them out again. Again, you know your community um, and what you want to do. I was just not a big fan of loaning out the laptops and the tablets. Um, the Chromebooks are pretty affordable. And if you have the Google uh, management stuff set up on it, if it doesn't come back, you can remotely shut it off, things like that. Um, hotspots got really popular, especially there was a lot of grant money to purchase hotspots and lend them mm -hmm. out into your communities. Um, my library in Kinetic, we lended hotspots out and they were never in the library. They were gone constantly. Um, and they were something that we had to really hound people to return them because they checked it out, took it home, and that was their internet access. And um, nice thing is through our ISP that we got them from, if they didn't come back, after several months, we could have them disabled and shut off. And then they usually would show back up the door or we'd get a phone call from the person that they were two months overdue wanting to know why their hotspot wasn't working anymore. So um, they're a really popular item. If you want something that'll just go constantly circ and circ and circ. We had families that would return them and then uh, would camp out waiting to see if it would get put back out on the shelf before they left so they could grab it and check it out again. So you may have to think about having some policies around, hey, you just had it, you can't have it for some period of time or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, filtering, we're gonna do a big one on that July 26. Uh, if you're an e-write library, it is required to meet the CIPA, Children's Internet Protection Act guidelines. Um, if you're not an e-write library, but you have dedicated kids computers, you're probably doing something already to filter on the kid computers. But if you have dedicated fit kid computers, I really recommend you have something there just to avoid some issues. It's kind of a tough environment right now for libraries with a lot of that. And if you have somebody that sees something bad on a computer screen, um, it could cause some issues for you. Mm -hmm. A lot of things that people don't understand about filtering is how extensive it's used in cybersecurity. So if you're using really any kind of security product at all, like a firewall or even your ISPs have security that they're doing on your behalf, they're using filtering. I mean, it's a, it's just uh, filtering is the first, yeah. first moat, first wall in the defense for cybersecurity. So just be aware that if you don't like filtering rules be, that are required by E-rate for the pornography obscenity stuff, just be aware that it is, the first line of defense in any kind of reasonable cybersecurity setup filtering is. And again, we'll be doing a deep dive into that on July 26. Last thing to talk about, maker spaces. Um, I've set out a cup, set up a couple of those in our libraries. They tended, mine tended to be very, very popular, especially the laser cutter. Etcher got constant use. Um, one thing I recommend there is possibly if you set up computers in your maker space, that's where laptops make a lot of sense because they can be moved around the space and be very portable. And so that would be the one thing I would throw out there. A lot of times too, is you will have some very specific software on your Makerspace computers to run your 3D printer, to run your laser cutter. Um, if libraries have crickets, that's an online um, tool. Uh, creative is a creative space. I'm trying to remember what Cricut calls their, their online browser-based app now. So, but it does have a component that downloads locally to the computer. So be aware of that, but you'll run into 
uh, the need to support all that software, which gets back to the update thing. So if you've got the reboot and restore software on your computers, and you should, um, then your makerspace, there may be a lot more apps there that you have to run updates on once a month because of what's driving the equipment you offer. And that is all I've got. There's my contact info. If you have any questions on what we covered today, uh, this presentation, like Krista said, will be available for download. It's a great checklist just to um, for you to use. You can hand it off to your IT person. Is This is all the stuff Sherm says we should be doing on our computers. So I hope that's a benefit for you. And if you have any other questions, please ask them now. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, Sherm. Um, yeah, does anybody have any questions? See, almost everybody stuck around. That's awesome. Uh, if you have any last minute desperate questions you want to ask of Sherm right now, um, get it typed into the question section or any thoughts or ideas of things you've done at your library that have worked. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, otherwise, you can reach out to him there. Um, of course, you're at the Library Commission. Um, while we're waiting, um, Amanda, do you have anything else to add? Or it just your reminds own? me to do more cybersecurity for makerspace and tech gadget stuff. There's a lot of stuff. Yeah, and that can be the challenge with makerspaces because some of that stuff you'd like to lock it down a little more, but if you do, it's not usable. And especially yeah. when the when the devices you're offering, they may make you create an online account to be able to use it. And it's mm -hmm. that's that's just how it is. They don't think about, you know, a library offering this as a shared public use thing. Yeah. They think everybody's got it sitting in their home. And it's no big deal for you to have a login that's required that unfortunately requires your credit card information, yeah. things like that. If you run into that, um, what I did as my fix is I would get a uh, one of those preloaded credit cards for like mm -hmm. five yeah. or ten bucks. And that's what I used to set up the login that was required for um, Adobe. Uh, MakerBots, uh, anything that requires the credit card information, billing information, and that way that information is there. If somebody swipes it, it doesn't do them any good because what I do is usually set it up with a gift card and then I use it to go buy something on Amazon for the library. So the card number has a zero balance, but it's good enough to set those accounts up and make mm -hmm. them usable. Yeah, and you gotta. Yeah, I'm surprised that so many of these companies, since their makerspaces are so big and in so many libraries and schools and universities, that they haven't realized that this is what's happening a lot with yeah. your um, yeah, I've seen that a lot. Printers and the routers and the things you're selling. This is what's actually being happen happening. Yeah, on. I've seen that be a real hurdle for libraries that try and do Kindles. Um, mm -hmm. The Kindles require an Amazon account and it requires a credit card online, unless they've changed something I'm not aware of. And um, you know, then then the, the the library of the school runs into problems because you know you can't put the your good your actual credit card number on all these Kindles that people are checking out and taking home. So, and one question I did have is if you had tips for I have some like VR headsets and some different makerspace items that have social media integration. So mm -hmm. safety and security tips for locking down social media yeah, integration. That's that's tough. Um, we had our cooperation we did with the extension office for our makerspace in Sydney, we had two VR systems. And yeah. one of the apps that the Lincoln people really liked from, from the innovation studio was um, they had uh, the Facebook stuff even back yeah. then, yeah. but it required a Facebook account. And did you really want your teens logging into your VR computer um, with Facebook. Yeah. And because of the nature of the software with a VR system, we could not use reboot and restore software on it. So mm -hmm. yeah, it, that was a real challenge um, mm -hmm. where we had to, when we would do our initial VR training, we would basically tell people, do not set your own social media account up on this. We have a dummy account, please leave it alone. Don't use your own stuff and invariably um, I would routinely just go check them and I would find kids that logged in with their social media yeah. accounts and then the next kid that came in it would come right up into their account because they said yeah remember me <laughs> yeah and it was there and I have to go in and delete all that account stuff 
uh, where, you know, if we could have used the Reboot Restore software on our VR computers, that would have been great. But the way the VR software worked and did updates and stuff, it wasn't, uh, we couldn't make that go. So yeah. we had to constantly police that. And that's pretty much where I'm at now. I just wish there was like an easier way to do that in bulk, but mm -hmm. haven't found it. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. the IT market is all consumer driven now and it's, they, right. you know, it's, they, they just don't really th consider um, how that works. Mm. MetaQuest for classroom use. It's a thing, people. Yes. <laughs> yes, definitely. Or public use. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Amanda and Sharon. Oh, we didn't have any other questions that came in. That's okay. Um, you all know where to find um, both Sherm and Amanda here at the commission. Um, we do have some thank yous coming in. Thank you, Sherm and, and uh, NLC. Very informative. So um, definitely. All right. Yeah. So I am so, going... Sorry? I'm sorry. My two takeaways are lock down the BIOS, reboot, restore software. Those have to be done. The very least you're going to do, do those, and then work on all everything else. <laughs> all right, I'm going to pull presenter control back to my screen to wrap up things here today. There we go. All right, so thank you, everybody, for being here with us this morning. Um, thank you, Amanda and Sharon, for uh, joining us. Uh, um, I think we're going to have a lot of people doing some checking out their computers, talking to their IT people, or if they don't have one, understandable. That's why we do this. Um, you have all the information you need here to do it yourself if you need to. Um, so as I said, we um, did record the show. I'm going to go back to our main Encompass Live page here. Um, and as, as we did mention and Sherm did mention, um, next, week, next month's Pretty Sweet Tech on July 26th will be internet filtering for E-rate, SIPA compliance, and cybersecurity, not just for E-rate purposes. Um, so Sherm will be back with us in a month um, to talk about that. So if you are interested in that and want to learn more, uh, go ahead and register for that session. Um, our archive shows are, um, and any of our other shows coming up, got July filled up. I'm working on dates for August, so keep an eye on the calendar. Um, our archive shows are listed right here. The most recent one goes to the top of the page, so today's will be um, here. Should be done um, and uploaded and ready to go by the end of the day tomorrow at the latest, as long as GoToWebinar and YouTube uh, cooperate with me. <laughs> And everyone who attended today's show and registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know when it's ready. Um, as I said, we'll have a link to the recording on our YouTube channel and a link to uh, Sherm slides. We'll also push that information out on our various social media. Um, if you may have looked on our page here, we do have a Facebook page for Encompass Live. So if you'd like to use Facebook, give us a like over there. We post reminders. Here's your reminder to log in today's show, announcements about upcoming shows, and letting you know when recordings are available. So do give us a like over there. We also use Twitter from the Library Commission and Instagram, uh, where we use the hashtag EncompLive for the show and Pretty Sweet Tech for these particular episodes. So you can follow those hashtags as well if you want to. Um, on our archives here, I'll show you there is a search feature if you want to see if you've done a topic on any a show on any particular topic. You can search our full show archives or just the most recent 12 months. That is because, um, that we do have that limitation if you want to, because this is the full show archives for Encompass Live. And I'm not going to scroll all the way down because this is a huge list, as you can see. Uh, it goes back to when Encompass Live first premiered, which was in January 2009. So we're in our 15th year of the show. Yeah. Uh, so just keep an eye on, um, if you're watching a recording, look at the original broadcast date. They all have a date letting you know when they were first done. Um, many of the shows will stand the test of time, be still good, useful information, but some things will become old, outdated. Resources and information may be completely different. Some things may no longer exist anymore. Uh, links may be broken because something, you know, 50, 10 years ago no longer <laughs> exists. People may work at totally different libraries or our organizations um, from when they first presented. So just pay attention to those broadcast dates if you do watch any of our archives. Uh, so that wraps up today. Um, please do, as I said, register for Sherm's next session on our next Pretty Sweet Tech on July 26 on internet filtering. And next week, we're going to be talking about books for kids and teens. Uh, many, many states have a one book, what, what, one, whatever states, cities have them. Uh, here in Nebraska, we have a one book for Nebraska kids and teens program where each year books are selected that um, kids can and teens can read. I'll be talking about our current 2023 titles and we'll be announcing the 2024 titles. Um, they have been selected and we'll find out 
um, we'll all find out together next week what those new titles are for next year. So if you're interested in doing any one book type programming for kids and teens, uh, follow us um, and watch next week's show. Other than that, that wraps up everything up everything up for today. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Amanda and Sherm. See you both next month. See you. <laughs> and hopefully see all of you at a future episode of Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Cool. And our recording is done. Perfect.